some forewarning, I tease apart and examine some of these questions I've been asked, which leads me to ask you questions to think about. I think this, if not strictly important, is useful because questions often come with unexamined presuppositions within them or in how their answers will be received. Also, sometimes I don't answer the question directly, but a related question, or just go off on a tangent. For warning out of the way, let us proceed. This Q&A is chunked into different sections. Biographical, conlanging, world building, video making, hypotheticals, and other. What's your favorite conlang, your favorite part of conlanging, your favorite book or book series, your favorite myth or favorite folktale, your favorite part of creating fictional cultures, your favorite word ever created, your favorite grammatical features, your favorite color, your favorite animal, your favorite food, your favorite person, your favorite place. The truth of the matter is, I don't really have favorites of anything. There are different things I like in different contexts, that's all. And I don't have a hierarchy of what things I like best compared to others. As a child, when people asked me what my favorite color was, I would say, what purpose is served by preferring one color over another? Or, my favorite color for what? For my walls? My clothes? Your clothes? I won't get into the post hoc philosophical rationalization for my not having favorites right now, but maybe another time. Yet your question prompts me to ask you, why do you want to know what my favorite things are? Mere curiosity? To see if we have shared favorites? because you value my opinion or preferences? Mull on that while I address other questions, and maybe at the end of the vid, I'll come back to my favorite things. Why lichen? Why not moss? I chose the moniker lichen, more or less on a whim. In hindsight, I would say I chose it because A. I like the substance itself. I think it looks really neat. B. I like how the word lichen sounds. C. Lichen is a symbiotic organism. And I think this symbiosis reflects well my video making and conlanging endeavors, which involves working with and for others. And D, no one has strong opinions about liking. It's just this neutral stuff that exists in nature and people aren't too bothered about it one way or another, which is the sort of temperament I like others to have about me. The related question, why not moss, is interesting. It seems to presuppose that I deliberately chose liking to the exclusion of moss, which is by no means the case. This is a common fallacy I encounter where if someone says they like X, there's a presupposition that they dislike Y. Like if I said, I like dogs, you might presume I dislike cats, which is wrong. I think both are delicious. I like moss just as much as the next person, and just happen not to have thought about it when making my moniker. What slash how many instruments do you play? I play the piano and used to play electric guitar. And I sing, if that counts. Sometimes I put on little concerts on Discord. What languages do you speak, and why did you learn them? Are there any natlangs that you are particularly fond of, and why? Which ones do you have plans to learn in the future? I speak English natively through my parents, and in my childhood spoke exclusively Cantonese outside the home, but have since forgotten it all. Je peux parler un petit peu en français parce que c'était obligatoire de l'apprendre à l'école, et malgré le fait que c'est bien évident que je suis pas francophone, C'est assez facile pour moi de parler avec les francophones sur les sujets quotidiens. Ruskizik, mu kagda ya bol ribyonkum ya khatiel rabotits kazmanaftam, a tagda mu smyi jili v Amerike. Vy znate, ruski i amerikanci sigda rabotyot v mesie v kosmosie. I paetemu amerikancem nada imeits kavarits na ruskom. Ya nachal uchitsa svayim svodne vremya самостоятельно, с книгами и так далее. И сейчас, очевидно, я не космонавт, но, тем не менее, мне очень нравится говорить с людьми на русском. В несколько лет в Арабии я подрастала в Лежаме в Хелал Арбаа Сануат. Лимада? Лимада ла. Это лега тутир ихтимами. И кунту астамтия бидерасат тариха шарка лаузат. И в вакт тиглими كان خصني نسكن في الشرق الوسط ولا في الشمال الافريقيه وداكشي علاش اخترت نسكن في المغرب وتسمى تعلمت شوي من الدرجه وكتعجبني الدرجه بزاف يونيفرسيتي ما اك اوبشنال موديول هو تي تي هندي بهاشا تو ما انا ابني ابسي كها كيوناي اور اج كال ما ميري دوستون كي ساد جسكو هندي يا اردو اتي هي कभी-कभी प्रैक्टिस की कोशिश करता हूं 
to answer whether there are any languages I'm particularly fond of, I circle back to my previous point of not having favourites. Each has their perks and pitfalls. Future plans far on hold for learning anything else, as I would rather consolidate what I currently have than only have a passing familiarity with many, many languages. Why did you get into YouTube and world building? I think the very first thing that got me into YouTube was making a Conlang showcase for Alpine Neptune, which has now changed its name to and evolved into Byakumi, as a means for having an external viewership for my work to make me settle into the choices I'd made about the language, instead of constantly tinkering and having it be perpetually mercurial. This did not work, as I still tinker endlessly, so I think the only way to really solidify the language is to publish something in it, like a grammar or a short story. However, I really enjoyed the video making process, and during lockdown here in the UK I had a reasonable amount of spare time and was living alone, so I decided to make the 12 tips video, still my most popular video to date. Now, I've just mentioned two videos external to the one you're watching or listening to right now, so I could say, be sure to check them out, but instead I'll say, hold the newsreader's nose squarely, waiter, or friendly milk will countermand my trousers. Returning to the second half of the question, what got me into world building, the answer was the realization that my constructed language could not exist without a culture to embed it within. This realization came pretty late, but it has been fun fleshing out this culture. However, I don't really have any interest in fantasy or building a whole world, so my world building takes place on planet Earth with humans and nothing magical in sight. For now, at least. I make no promises. What makes you happy, apart from conlanging? I think what makes me happy can often be as simple as avoiding things that make me miserable. Notably, I avoid being still inert and unmoving, sleeping irregularly, fleeting pleasures like screen time, caffeine, sugar and so on, stoking negative emotions over things I have no control over, goals that are vague, pursuing happiness directly, following my instincts and feelings without thinking about them, complaining, and keeping a tally of all the bad things that happen in my life. But more concretely, and in no particular order, I enjoy writing, short stories, essays, poems and plays, walking in nature or cities, teaching people, hosting parties, making music, and studying languages. So what was your first world build? Like, your first civilization, conlang, world, etc.? No idea. Probably a constructed language based on Huttese from Star Wars and a vocab list I found on the internet that I created grammar for. But why is the first world build important for you to know? Often the first time someone does something, they do it badly. Or perhaps you're interested in the route I took into conlanging and world building to determine which came first. Or perhaps it's comforting to know that everyone's first attempt is basically a shambles. I'll let that mull. How did you learn so much about linguistics? I wouldn't say I actually know all that much about linguistics, but the main way I've learned what I have is by reading articles and books on linguistics topics. And the reason I read them is because I'm interested in linguistics in of itself, and not merely to the end of using my linguistic knowledge for conlangs. I've read plenty of things that I don't remember, but stuff I find interesting usually sticks, and I often reread papers to get a second understanding of them. Plus, having linguistically inclined, enthusiastic friends helps, whether those friends are in real life or through digital acquaintance. I've noticed a phenomenon that people new to conlangs or new to linguistics quickly become frightened of the jargon, which incidentally, if you rearrange the letters, sounds like dragon. But the dragon of jargon, like dragons, is a myth. I love jargon, not because it alienates folks and seats me in an ivory tower, nor indeed the usefulness with which it is to have precise vocabulary for describing particular phenomena, but because, when I encounter a word or phrase I don't know or don't understand, I am filled with delight at the prospect of learning something new. Read, listen, absorb, and smile. And yeah, you might use terminology wrong at first, or understand it wrong at first, but practice makes perfect. Another way of my learning about linguistics that comes to mind is really critically examining the languages I have had the opportunity to study, enjoying them in of themselves and not merely as an end to pass an exam. Do you know much about Austronesian and Polynesian languages, more specifically Maori? Not yet. 
but boy am I delighted at the prospect of reading about them. Do you currently, or have you ever, played any tabletop role-playing games? I have not. Got any recommendations? How many languages have you made? In terms of languages created to personal satisfaction, none. Otherwise, I've made a handful of sketches and some more well-developed ones. I'd be hard-pressed to give an exact number, as there are plenty of things I've totally forgotten about that I occasionally come across in old computer files or notebooks. Plus, lots of projects change and evolve over time, such that each stage of a given language can be unrecognisable from its other stages. More importantly, though, I think there is limited utility in asking how many conlangs has X person made? Why do you want to know this? What value would you ascribe to an answer of zero, or one, or ten, or fifty? What is your favorite idiomatic expression or group of related expressions from a natural language that you would adapt for a conlang? Ah, favorites again. Or rather, lack thereof. I wouldn't say that I particularly desire to, nor have, adapted existing natural language expressions into a constructed language. Rather, if you have a well-defined system of conceptual metaphors, then idioms can often come about of their own accord. To elucidate, let's look at a conceptual metaphor in Bianchimi. Emotions as bodies of water. Here, emotions are the target domain, and bodies of water is the source domain. Because emotions are conceptualized as bodies of water, you get mappings like the following. A person is a canyon or a valley. Anger is white water. Hysteria, flooding. Emotional repression is damming. Desolation is drought. Emotional durability is commensurate with the volume of the water. Emotional volatility is mapped onto bends in a river. Being affected is paralleled by pollution or silt. Insanity is breaking banks. And emotional brittleness is frozen water. These mappings can consequently lead to phrases like he wept a flood to mean he cried hysterically. She doesn't swell with the rain to mean she's emotionally durable. He's a meager creek to mean he's immature. She's like a backwards waterfall. She's emotionally unusual with great extremity. He's in the mountains. He's immature. She met the sea. She had an overwhelming experience, whether good or bad. A bit like how awe and terror just refer to massive emotion, whether good or bad, and thus we have those weird good-bad doublets of awesome, awful, and terrific, terrible. Now, this isn't to say that adapting Natlang idioms is bad. By all means, do it. And beyond conceptual metaphors, cultural practices often give rise to metaphors. But bear in mind that with a bit of mind grease, what you can adapt, you can also invent. How do you come up with interesting grammar features for a conlang, especially concerning conjugation? Again, examination of the question. What qualifies as interesting? That's pretty subjective, but it does make me think that more important than the actual individual features of the grammar are how those features interact. It's like cooking. The individual ingredients may be ordinary or plain, but combining them in certain amounts and in a certain order can yield massively different dishes in taste and texture. Regarding my approach to conlangs, I usually try and map out only a few grammatical features to start with and see how those interact. Let's look at some more specific examples in Biakami. I knew I wanted polypersonal agreement in Biakami, but I decided to arbitrarily limit this to only two arguments. Why? Just to see what would happen. And what happened was twofold. First was the introduction of applicatives to promote certain arguments to the direct object slot, like locations and instrumentals. The second thing that happened was my thinking very hard about what the default roles of verbs would be, where I came up with a rule that if a verb of three arguments requires two of those arguments to be animate entities, then those two will take the subject and direct object slots. Let's look at the verbs feed, give, help, write, and bake, with three arguments each. Martin Haspelmath feeds slop to the pigs. George Lakov gives presents to his family. Alexandra Eichenfeld helps a student understand linguistic typology. Fernando Zuniga writes a letter to the president. And Daniel Everett bakes a cake for a friend. Now, if we remove the recipient from each of these, some of the sentences become grammatically unsound, while others are fine. 
Martin Haspelmath feeds slop. George Lakov gives presence. Alexandra Eichenwald helps understand linguistic typology. Fernando Zuniga writes a letter. Daniel Everett bakes a cake. By this deduction, then, verbs like feed, give, and help have the two arguments marked on the verb as the subject and recipient, while for verbs like write and bake, the two things marked on the verb are the subject and the object, and therefore require an applicative construction when other arguments are focused. Polypersonalism out of the way, I also knew I wanted a volition difference in verbs as an essential quality of them. At the same time, I had a few noun classes that I could divide into two superclasses. Active, which had humans and animates, and inert, which was inanimate, locations and abstractions. It seemed a natural consequence to me that inert nouns could never be the subject of a volitional verb, as inert things cannot exercise will, while active nouns could be the subject of both a volitional or non-volitional verb, as they can perform actions with or without will. For a transitive example, using simplified glosses, person, stone, break, volitional, the person broke the stone, on purpose. Person, stone, break, non-volitional, the person broke the stone, on accident. Meanwhile, if we had the stone broke the window, this could only be rendered with a non-volitional verb because stones, falling into the inert superclass, have no volition. Stone, window, break, non-volitional. This seemed like a neat interaction between the volition system and the noun class system. And there are other such interactions, but I won't get into them here. I could also discuss verbal agreements, disagreeing with the plurality of argument nouns, but I have other questions to be answering. How do you deal with co-references? Do you use things like switch reference or logophoricity? Depends on the language. Biarchemy is my central project at the moment, so in that language there are noun classes that have agreement indexed on the verb, where each noun class corresponds to a certain verbal prefix. However, the human classes show a distinction between proximal and obviative forms, where the proximal is used for the most salient argument of the discourse, with the obviative used for all others. Sort of. Marcibus vale ni qui escajont? Marcibus vale qui escajont? Here we can see that the first example has the proximal human suffix attached to both verbs, indicating Mary is the subject of both, but in the second example only on the first verb, indicating a different subject for each. Now, let's imagine a scenario where the unnamed she in the subclause, presumably referenced overtly earlier in the discourse, is the focus of what we're talking about. Maria Busvale ne Kieska Jont. Only one rendering and interpretation is possible. Lastly, let's imagine a scenario where John is the focus. Mari Yebusvale ne Yekiska Jont. Here, where John is the focus, it's ambiguous whether Mary saw John or another woman saw him, because both have been indexed with the obviative affix. So that's one way of dealing with co-references. Another is assumptions based on the expected behaviour of certain noun classes. Let's take the English, the rock hit the window and it broke. While it is almost guaranteed that this will mean the window broke, it could mean the rock broke. However, with the sentence, the rock hit the window and broke, it must be the rock that breaks. In Biakumi, nouns belonging to the inert classes have no obviation associated with them, but there is an assumption that these inert nouns will be the patient of an action. So, using some loan words, because I've not yet coined anything for rock or window, we can render the sentence tasksa. This would mean the rock hit the window, and it, the window, broke. To specify that the rock had broken, you'd need to reintroduce it into the discourse, either with a conjunction and a full noun phrase, or, actually more naturally, or, if some deictic marker had been used with a certain item, to reuse that deixis with a conjunction. Which part of Conlang do you spend the most time on and why? Again, I wonder what the value of this question is. 
I think I spend the most time trying to decide what shapes words and affixes and morphemes will have. Everything else also takes a very long time. When do we get more Alpine Neptune? Well, Alpine Neptune is now Biarchemy, and I keep revising it, so it might be a while before I post anything about it for public consumption. But I have a lot more free time now, so hopefully something soon. What property of a language that is not found in any other language would you like to embody? I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a property of a language that is not found in any other language. But if we change the scope of the question to what property not found in any language would you like to embody, I would probably say teleportation. So far as I know, no languages can teleport, but that is a property I would like myself to have. I think that would be super useful. What was your first conline? And was it a good conline? This question poses several difficulties. First, my first conline, if there ever was one, was years ago, and probably not something I remember or have records of. Second, good is a super subjective measurement, and can only be reckoned objectively if there is an external set of criteria to compare the language against. Given that my first constructed language was certainly just a result of tinkering and playing with language, it had no particular goal, and therefore no external criteria against which to judge its goodness. So it was neither good nor bad. It simply was. Should grammar be kept simple for proto-languages? There is no such thing as simple grammar. Grammars are just complex in different areas. What most English speakers mean when they say simple grammar is actually morphologically simple, insofar as words don't change their shape depending on agreement or role and so on. In Russian, each noun has six cases across singular and plural, making a total of 12 forms. In Spanish, verbs have a zillion forms, so far as I can tell. These two parts of these two languages are complex in terms of their morphology. But let's look at where English could be said to be complex. The king's son had been born under the new moon. A normal sentence. But if we rearrange the words to had the king's son been born under the new moon, we now have a conditional clause. And we're not just taking the whole verbal construction and shunting it to the beginning, we're taking one of two auxiliaries and putting it at the beginning, with the subject following and then the rest of the verbal construction. How maddeningly complex, how infuriatingly illogical, how arcane and weird. So my first point is, for you Anglophones out there, learn to dissociate the idea of general complexity from morphological complexity. My second point is this, and is more central. Proto-languages are just languages in their own right. They are no more simple nor complex than any other language. The proto bit of them doesn't mean they are defective, primitive, lacking, or undeveloped in some way. It just means that they precede something else. Top three tips to start conlanging. One, define your goals. Two, read widely in terms of linguistics. Three, don't share your work to start with. Read others' works and learn from the critique they receive. If you post your first attempt looking for feedback, the unfortunate truth is you'll probably get dunked on and consequently discouraged. Part of being a good creator of any kind is being able to appraise the flaws your work might have. Then, when you do come to share your work, you can share what parts you think might need improving. And when you come to share your work, be sure to state your goals for it so that the critique you receive can be appropriately framed and ultimately useful to both yourself and anyone else reading the critique. What is the draw of naturalistic languages? Much art is made in imitation of nature. Just look at gaming. Graphics are continuing to be developed to make the games look more real. Why? Perhaps this draws the player further into the experience of the game. Likewise, naturalistic languages can draw in a reader by giving the illusion of being real. I also think part of it is that naturalistic languages are super challenging, and that once the rules and trends have been mastered, you can toy with them in ways that are innovative and fun. Yet, the video game industry also has plenty of hugely popular games made of pixely graphics. These games are deliberately made this way, either to give an old-timey feel, or due to budget constraints, or simply because the developers like them. A constrained visual medium yields challenges of its own, and the same can be said of engineered and deliberately non-naturalistic languages. What is the draw of conlanging in general for you personally? 
I like the elegance of developing a system and seeing where the pieces go once they've been set into motion. I also enjoy the opportunity to reconceptualize the world. Not too many hobbies allow you to restructure the way you contemplate reality. I've heard it said that conlings without a world are homeless and vague, mostly pointless. What do you think? I used to think this was absolutely false, and that conlangs could totally exist without any associated culture. But for naturalistic human languages, I think this is difficult to accomplish, as culture and language interact with each other in many, many ways, and to neglect the culture aspect is to deny yourself a great part of the language experience. Having said that, plenty of languages are fine as works of art without associated cultures because they're made for something else, like Ithquil or Lojban or Esperanto. I think the phrase homeless and vague is a bit harsh, and that one need not have a whole world conceptualised for the language to inhabit, but I think it does one good to have a general conception of what the speakers of a given language are like. Are there any linguistic traits that you think would be fun to mess with but have never done so? Absolutely. What do you feel are some of the more underappreciated or less talked about skills involved with conlanging and world building? I didn't think I would have a lot to say about this, but now I do. And I've divided it into two areas, community skills and individual skills. Community skills. One, learn to take feedback and critique. A, take responsibility for the fact you've put something into the world. By putting your work into the world, you have taken an action for which you are solely responsible. It doesn't matter where you're from, how old you are, or what your neurological state is. People will give feedback on it, some of it hurtful, and some of it helpful. B. You can disregard or ignore feedback. Don't lash out. C. Emotionally untangle yourself from the project. D. Don't expect any feedback. E. When looking for feedback, be super specific about what you're looking for. State your goals. State what you think your flaws are. Never say, is this good? F. Don't be beholden to the opinions of strangers. Fact is, mob rule sucks. If your projects are constantly tinkered to ensure that everyone enjoys them, you'll never be happy, and they'll never be happy. By the same token, those who do give feedback are often a vocal minority, so take their opinions with salt. G. Don't expect praise, or for anyone to like what you've made. And H. Resist showing off the first thing you've made. Assess it yourself before putting it out into the world. You might decide it could use some polish. 2. Giving feedback and critique. Broadly, be kind or be silent. If it's clear someone is clearly a noob and doesn't know what they're doing, don't dunk on them. And if you can't bring yourself to be civil, just say nothing. People can often learn by experimenting around themselves. It's not your job to improve them. Oftentimes, the best feedback is asking them what their goals are, so that they can learn to seek feedback within a framework, and so that you can be sure to couch your answers as fruitfully as possible. B. Individual skills. 1. Patience. No one becomes good at anything immediately. Also, repetition is not the same as practice. Practice requires thoughtfulness. 2. Willingness to improvise. Sometimes things turn out unexpectedly. Roll with it, see where it leads. 3. Allow messiness and be okay with ambiguity. Languages and cultures and worlds are messy and very rarely do things fall into neat, discrete categories. 4. Don't feel like you need to know everything. It's okay to ignore or hand-wave certain parts of conlanging or world-building, as long as you're making a conscious effort to say, I won't go deep into this area. Maybe you'll come back to it, maybe you won't. But being able to leave things alone or undeveloped allows you to avoid getting stuck in ruts. 5. Read widely both in fiction and non-fiction. If you live in a city, read about how life happens outside the urban environment. If you speak only one language, learn another. If you subscribe to a particular religion or non-religion, read about some others. 
and if you are writing in a particular genre, say, read with a critical eye and take note of things you like and dislike and why you like or dislike them, or mechanisms you think the author does well. 6. Be willing to seek advice from others or collaborate with them. Fact is, you can't be an expert at everything, so being able to reach out to others for help is a great skill to work on. 7. Organisation and presentation. Organise your own notes so that you know where things are and what they're about, and when presenting your creations to a wider audience, make sure they are presented clearly. Write in full sentences. Use punctuation. Give some background to what you're presenting and what you're seeking from the presentation, whether that's feedback, critique, praise or validation. What do you suggest for people who are having a hard time finding the motivation to conline? So I think there are three things to be done. One, stimulate motivation through action. Two, talk your problems out. Or three, take a break, outsource or give up. So firstly, we all know that motivation breeds action. But I think it's equally true that action breeds motivation. If you're unmotivated, just do something, even just making your bed. That's how I get started for the day. And that bit of movement gives me motivation to sort breakfast and then work and then so on. So for conlanging, maybe draw on a piece of paper or go for a walk and make noises to yourself. Secondly, talking out your problems really helps. By framing your problems as a question, you inadvertently analyse them, and in so doing might realise a possible answer even before the question is asked. Thirdly, take a break from it. There is such a thing as creative burnout as opposed to a creative block. Try something else for a bit and come back to it. Or maybe outsource the work to someone else. You might like what they make, or dislike it, and decide you can do better, and blam, now you have motivation. But lastly, maybe give up. If you're really, really struggling to find motivation to do something, and you're not enjoying it, why continue? This is a hobby after all, and hobbies are meant to be fun. If the fun stops, stop the hobby. Now, this isn't to say to stop when things become difficult. It all hinges on whether you enjoy the challenge that the difficulties present. I know I certainly do, which is why my progress is slower than the slide of a catatonic snail. But slowness aside, I enjoy myself. Have you experimented with any conlang sign language, and or do you know of any good ones? This is something I have yet to look into. I'm not super interested in creating a fully-fledged sign language but I might make one with a small restricted vocabulary used for certain kinds of tacit communication, like when hunting. What interests me more is the co-occurrence of certain gestures with certain spoken words. Like when speaking Moroccan Darija, if you say the word for lots, bizeth, it almost always co-occurs with a movement of an open hand, vertically aligned, starting with the thumb under the chin and moving forward in an arc. With a word for nice or beautiful, Zween co-occurs with a flicking outwards movement of the fingers. How would you involve a culture for a world building? Maybe this could be another video, or a series of videos. Assuming this question is meant as it's written, I would involve a culture and world building by plonking them into the work. Assuming this question is asking how I would evolve a culture for world building, I'm not sure. I've not actually done all that much cultural evolution yet. I imagine I would go off and read a bunch of history books and anthropology papers to see how human societies have changed according to changes in belief, climate and interaction with other groups, etc. Regarding whether I'd do that for a video or series, I'll address this later on. When, why and how did you start world building? I cannot answer this with any degree of certainty, nor do I consider myself a world builder in any real sense. Yet. In my childhood, we never had a television, so all my free time was spent either reading books, building things, or playing games of the imagination. A friend and I would go out for a walk, and using our favourite books as frameworks, we'd create stories and creatures and characters and plots that we just talked through and acted out. I was interested in science fiction, and when I came to enjoy writing, an activity that used to make me cry, most of my stories would be science fiction. But they never felt like I was world building per se, as I would just take a single concept and then extrapolate off it. I've never really read or enjoyed fantasy, and I know some people enjoy it because they can get lost or absorbed into a whole new world. For me, I can get lost or absorbed in any fictional tale, regardless of whether it's set in Middlesex or Middle Earth. On this same thread, I don't world build or write fiction as a form of escapism. I really like the real world and the life I share with my friends in it. 
My world building, or more broadly my fiction, always harkens back to the real world, however, to address an issue or moral problem I see with it, as some problems can seem fresher or more pressing or more understandable when seen through a foreign lens. We're veering away from the question. You asked when, why, and how did I start world building, and I think the simple progression was this. Imaginative childhood games led to writing stories, led to getting into conlanging, led to creating cultures to complement the conlangs. I'm still working on this last part. Who knows what it will develop into. What is your motivation for world building? Again, we come to a question of motivation. I suppose I do it because I enjoy it. I don't enjoy plate tectonics and climates, nor orbital periods of celestial bodies, nor magic and elves. So my world building is limited to what I enjoy, which so far is human cultures. Similar to us, but different enough to be strange and compelling. I enjoy the interplay between language and culture. I enjoy making rash decisions like, my people will have colourful sleeves, or they will have many, many tattoos, and then going off and reading about clothing and body modification. I enjoy questioning what I believe, and developing the beliefs of imaginary others. Because I enjoy these things, and because I don't bother with what I don't enjoy, the idea of motivation doesn't really come into it. I just do it. And yes, one day I might enjoy plate tectonics and orbital periods and magic, but not for the moment. As an aside, I think one great way to be demotivated is to focus on too many things at once. When I'm working out a problem, my phone is off, there is no music, and I just have some paper and a pen. I might need to look something up, but I'll make a note of that and look it up later. Don't underestimate the power of time spent unstimulated. And don't underestimate the corrosion of constant stimulation. And yes, everyone has different thresholds for their optimum amount of stimulation. So experiment, see what works. And sometimes, just allow yourself to be bored. Nothing in my experience creates motivation quite like boredom. Some of my best work was done in bus stations or waiting in a line at the bank. Boredom is painful. And as creatures that crave novelty and stimulation, items like smartphones are an absolute bane. Next time you're in a queue, try looking at your mind instead of looking at your phone. Or don't. It's your life. Live it how you want to. I'm just telling you what works for me. And given that we've, again, veered off a little from the question, let's segue seamlessly into the next section. Are there any channels that you haven't collaborated with that you're either planning on or would like to in the future? If there are planned collabs, who are they with? Yes, and I cannot say. I cannot say because for collabs currently in production, it creates an onus on us to actually finish the project even if we latterly discover or decide it's rubbish. And I cannot say for prospective collaborations because if they don't happen, you and I will just feel disappointed. So just look in at this channel once in a while and maybe there will be a collab waiting for you. Also, how do you make your videos and scripts for them? I usually write out my scripts by hand and then type them up. I then record them on my computer using QuickTime in a room where I strategically place pillows and blankets on noisy or noise-reflecting things. I make the images of the video in PowerPoint and string the images together with the audio in iMovie. It's not super advanced stuff, which is why my videos are basically glorified slideshows. Where do you get your icons from? Microsoft PowerPoint. Gotta love those default icons. Though I do make some of my own using my limited visual editing skills. Do you prefer us liking or disliking your videos? There are two definitions of like here. If we take the meaning to be clicking the thumbs up button, then I'm perfectly indifferent as to whether you do this or not, or do the thumbs down. If we take the meaning to be enjoy or not, of course I would prefer people to enjoy my videos. If not, I probably wouldn't make them. But also, I'm happy for people not to enjoy my videos if they still gain something from it, whether it's simply a fun fact or a fresh way of thinking about something. Why do you not want likes and subscriptions? Do you really not want to have any subscribers? My saying, don't like and don't subscribe, at the end of my videos began for a few reasons. First, I found it quite annoying at the end of videos to hear the video maker, ostensibly an erudite, thoughtful individual, devolve into this wheedling, supplicating, ugh, chanting the mantra, and don't forget to like and subscribe. It's a thoughtless gesture at this point, and furthermore, I trust my audience has enough sense to decide for themselves whether or not they wish to like and subscribe. 
I'm not actually forbidding liking or subscribing. I'm just saying the opposite of what most people hear to encourage the audience to think about it a little bit. If you enjoy something, you're perfectly capable of going back to it yourself without relying on the computer foisting some choices on you. But if you want the computer to foist, that's also fine. The second reason I say don't like and don't subscribe is because I never intended to make videos with any kind of regularity nor to have an audience, so it seemed appropriate. The third reason is that while I do feel the warm glow of self-worth when I see I have X number of subscribers, I get most of my validation out of things I do in real life, or just knowing that I've made a good work. I don't try and seek digital kudos, so I'm neutral as to whether I have subscribers or not. If you could know or learn one lost language from any time period in the past, which would you choose? Hmm, difficult choice this one. It might be interesting to know Proto-Indo-European to see how right or wrong our hypotheses about it are. It might also be interesting to know a language from Neolithic Europe. Or maybe Minoan and be literate in Linear A. Or maybe know a language from tens or hundreds of thousands of years ago to see if any essential features of human language have changed since then. If you were to pick a time and a place to live in that was at least 50 years removed from right now, where and when would you live? Assuming you're able to assimilate comfortably regardless of your choice, and why? I would live sometime in the future, maybe after Mars has been terraformed enough to go outside and breathe, because I think that would be cool. What is your dream job? I think this is one of those questions bound to make someone miserable. Because if you think you know what your dream job is, you'll be forever dissatisfied with all other jobs. I think instead of a singular dream job, there are probably many jobs that could suit someone's strengths and ambitions, in much the same way that I don't think we all have a singular soulmate out in the world, but rather a handful of people we are maximally compatible with. Also, a person's strengths and ambitions might change, so what begins as a dream job might cease to be one. With this caveat in place, I think my main strengths involve language, whether in speech or writing, and my ambition is to bring joy and knowledge and thoughtfulness to others. Based on this, I could be a priest, a comedian, a party organiser, a diplomat, a novelist, a teacher, or a tamada. You don't know what a tamada is? Well, according to a slightly edited version of Wikipedia, a tamada is a Georgian toastmaster at a Georgian supra, feast, or at a wedding. At all supras, regardless of size, there is a tamada, or toastmaster, the one person who introduces each toast. Georgians like to say that the tamada is the dictator of the table, but it would be more appropriate to compare him to a leader or even a teacher. Tamada traditionally ought to be eloquent, intelligent, smart, sharp-witted, and quick-thinking, with a good sense of humour, since very often some of the guests might try to compete with him on the toast-making. At the Georgian table, a tamada is considered to help bridge the gap between past, present, and future, toasting ancestors and descendants, as well as the other guests at the table. A toast can be proposed only by a tamada. The rest are to develop the idea. Naturally, we've only looked at strengths and ambitions without taking into account certain realities like how one's personality meshes with that job, or opportunities available to achieve it. So far as I know, being a tamada is not a viable job in the United Kingdom. But I didn't want to take up too much time on this question. However, it's worth noting that if I lost my power of speech, or my ambition changed, for example, to make the world a more just place, then the array of possible dream jobs for me would also change. What would you do if everyone but you disappeared for a day? Well, firstly, I would probably freak out a little bit. If simply everyone had disappeared, that would mean no one would be flying aeroplanes or tending to nuclear reactors. So unless the automated systems of those machines are very good, I would be concerned about those things presenting an imminent danger. I would also wonder to myself why I hadn't disappeared. Was I dead? A ghost? Was this hell? Heaven? A parallel reality? I would also probably start a time-stamped video record of what I was doing and what I was seeing. At the time of the disappearance, I wouldn't know whether anyone would be coming back. But if they did, I could use that record to show what the world was like with everyone gone. And I could prove that I had been unaffected by the disappearance, and make a religion out of that, and therefore become a living god, and take apotheosis off my bucket list. On a practical side of things, I would probably telephone everyone I know, assuming telephones continued working 
to check that the disappearance of everyone wasn't merely a local phenomenon, and I'd turn on the radio to listen for any updates. Then, if I were convinced that everyone was indeed gone, I would probably find a nice place to sit and enjoy reading a book or write something, which is how I would normally spend my free time. I would also outline a plan of how long to wait before going and getting supplies, and I'd probably go to the public library and take out some survival books. I'd basically treat that day as a kind of holiday, of the kind where people go to the mountains for a quiet retreat far from civilization, and spend the day walking and reading and writing mostly. Then, at the end of the day I'd go to sleep, and the next morning wake up with the rest of the world back and be massively relieved. Out of the worlds you've created, which one would you prefer to live in? Ha! This presupposes I've created more than one world, and that they are functionally different from life on Earth. But I think life in the Third Range, where the Biarchimi live, would be pleasant. Long houses, big families, society governed by values I think it ought to have. <clears throat> How do you find resources and materials to read on certain topics? Is there any topic that you haven't been able to find? I use a mixture of things. Public libraries, academic articles online, for which there are many websites that give free downloads, books I purchase, and lectures that have been put online. I'm sure there have been topics I've been unable to find, or at least unable to find in English, but reading something related often helps, or one can piece together an answer by assessing several related papers or books. I was originally going to say, I can't help you with this, but then I thought about it some more and realised a sense of torture might arise from three things. Mind you, this is a non-exhaustive list, so there could be other additional factors. 1. A desire to be perfect. 2. Comparing yourself with others. And 3. Not defining success. So, first we might feel tortured from a desire to be perfect, to which I say, relinquish the desire to be perfect. Perfection cannot be attained. So while I laud the attempt to get near perfection, don't feel bad when you fail, as attaining perfection is impossible, but striving towards it is worthwhile indeed. Second, comparisons. I think we tend to compare ourselves to others working on similar things, and in the blinding light of their success we feel small, diminished, and inconsequential. However, I think it is important to untangle comparisons between people and comparisons between works, and once that untangling has been done, try and limit the variables between the two works. For instance, person A might compare his world building with person B. Person A has one small town set in a medieval fantasy land that they've been working on for a few weeks, while person B has a complex array of societies across several planets in a cosmos they have been designing for decades. You can see now that a direct comparison is going to make you miserable, and also is not going to be particularly useful. Third, success. I think people have rather vague ideas about what success is, and to eliminate that vagueness, I think it is helpful to write out what you define success as. Bear in mind, success might be entirely separate from prestige and separate from happiness. Do you want praise and admiration? If so, from whom? What about prizes? Validation? Self-satisfaction? Money? Give it some thought. What is cheese? Cheese is a dairy product produced in wide ranges of flavours, textures and forms by coagulation of the milk protein casein. It comprises proteins and fat from milk, usually the milk of cows, buffalo, goats or sheep. During production, the milk is usually acidified and the enzymes of either rennet or bacterial enzymes with similar activity are added to cause the casein to coagulate. The solid curds are then separated from the liquid whey and pressed into finished cheese. Some cheeses have aromatic moulds on the rind, the outer layer, or throughout. Over a thousand types of cheese exist and are currently produced in various countries. Their styles, textures, and flavours depend on the origin of the milk, including the animal's diet, whether they have been pasteurised, the butterfat content, the bacteria and mould, the processing, and how long they have been aged for. Herbs, spices, or wood smoke may be used as flavouring agents. The yellow to red colour of many cheeses is produced by adding annatto. Other ingredients may be added to some cheeses, such as black pepper, garlic, chives, or cranberries. 
a cheesemonger or specialist seller of cheeses, may have expertise with selecting the cheeses, purchasing, receiving, storing, and ripening them. For a few cheeses, the milk is curdled by adding acids such as vinegar or lemon juice. Most cheeses are acidified to a lesser degree by bacteria, which turn milk sugars into lactic acid. Then the addition of rennet completes the curdling. Vegetarian alternatives to rennet are available. Most are produced by fermentation of the fungus Mucor miehi, but others have been extracted from various species of the Kinara thistle family. Cheesemakers near a dairy region may benefit from fresher, lower-priced milk and lower shipping costs. Cheese is valued for its portability, long shelf life, and high content of fat, protein, calcium, and phosphorus. Cheese is more compact and has a longer shelf life than milk, although how long a cheese will keep depends on the type of cheese. Hard cheeses, such as Parmesan, last longer than soft cheeses, such as Brie or goat's milk cheese. The long storage life of some cheeses, especially when encased in a protective rind, allows selling when markets are favourable. Vacuum packaging of block-shaped cheeses and gas flushing of plastic bags with mixtures of carbon dioxide and nitrogen are used for storage and mass distribution of cheeses in the 21st century. What does this thumbnail mean? Raining lizards twice equals stranger? In my first Q&A video, I had said it was strange that I had acquired a thousand subscribers, and so I used an image of raining lizards to signify this strangeness. Thus, when it transpired I had 2,000 subscribers, I thought it was stranger. Doubly strange, in fact, like if it had rained lizards twice. Are you working on anything else? Do you have a focus project? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes, indeed. What do you hope for the rest of 2022? Big question. I suppose this means for the channel, as opposed to my aspirations for the world, or my plans for my garden. I would like to work on the following. A few more linguistics -y videos, a series called Clongify, where I try to flesh out invented languages mentioned in passing in works of fiction, that it would be fun to fill out into functional languages, more world-building videos. My content's been very conline focused and I'd like to branch out into the world-building more, especially for the Byakumi, and include within this some diegetic works set inside the Byakumi's world. Videos about the Byakumi language, maybe narrating short stories I've written with some cover art, turning famous essays into iambic pentameter, niche, I know, but I think it would be fun. Possibly some video essays on topics not necessarily related to conlanging or world building, based on chats with my friends. Well, that's it for now. I hope you found my answers to your questions entertaining and or informative. And if not, why are you still watching? Anyhow, I'll end this here as it's gone on quite long enough. And as always, don't like and don't subscribe.